Hi everybody. Um, first, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, hopefully you all are here to witness the event today, which is for such a so good, so important conversation. Um, my name is Alejandro Solais. I am a graduate student here in Central Michigan studying higher education administration. And I am currently the secretary for Sigma Lab Data and Analysis Management Program. I'll be writing shortly Latino based for training with Morgan Social Science. And we are uh, so grateful to be partnering with Mid Michigan College and the Office of Native American Programs um, for this so good, so important event. And without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Evan Barnhart. Dr. Barnhart is a renowned American archaeologist who has appeared on the History Channel, uh, Discovery Channel, Canadian's Religion Channel, and even Japanese public television. He is the director of Mind Exploration Center, a fellow of the Explorer Club, and a widely recognized authority on ancient astronomy, mathematics, and calendar systems. During his over 20 years in Latin American archaeology, he had discovered the ancient city of Mach, Na, and Be Belize, mapped over 4,000 ancient buildings, and published over a dozen articles and books. His research on ancient sciences has taken to over a dozen countries, including Cambodia, Indonesia, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. Through the teaching company's great courses, he's produced four video courses, including 130 minute lectures on subjects within the topic within the topic of ancient American civilization. His most recent projects are an eight-part travel show for great courses named Exploring the Mayan World, and a podcast series called Archaeo X. And without further ado, please give us a uh, warm round of applause for Dr. Barnes. Just one production. Let's see if I can get this microphone thing working. It sounds like it's working. Okay, I'll stick it in my back pocket. And I think Colleen, you'll be my lovely assistant changing the slides. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, well, um, today's topic that I want to talk to you about is America's forgotten pandemics, European first contact. And this is a really a rather grim su subject, so I'd like to start off on a slightly lighter note. Slide, please. <clears throat> First and foremost, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I am so happy to be able to say that and not Columbus Day. <laughs> it was ridiculous and frustrating that we had this day for the discoverer of a place where literally millions and millions of people were already living, and even further, that the man never even stepped foot in North America. <laughs> so it's really nice to be able to say, Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a start in the right direction. It certainly isn't game over. I would like to see one of the next steps being American history classes start slightly before 1492 because there was an incredible history here and civilizations long before the Europeans arrived. And as I'll describe to you today, the uh, arrival of the Europeans was kind of apocalyptic for those cultures. So uh, next slide. Unprecedented. We're all pretty sick of that word, aren't we? <laughs> uh, you know, everything has been labeled unprecedented for the last couple of years. COVID's unprecedented. Our economy is unprecedented. Our political turmoil is unprecedented. Our social movements are unprecedented. Everything is unprecedented these days. My wife has actually outlawed that word in our house. Everything in our house from now on was precedented in some way or another. It's no longer unprecedented anything. But you know, if we look at Hollywood, they tried to prepare us for all sorts of things. Uh, next slide. You know, we. We're all ready if uh, zombies attack, or if, uh, if it's aliens landing, or comets hitting the Earth, or even mega volcanoes. We're, we are prepared for all those things. Next slide. What we weren't prepared for is everybody hiding in their houses for a year, watching Netflix and eating ice cream. That's, that's how it turned out to be. <laughs> but seriously, next slide. COVID is not a joke. Currently, there are 4.5 million people on the planet dead 
because of COVID and it's not over. And that number is probably low compared, you know, numbers like that are only as good as the data collected. It's probably higher than that. And what's really frightening is this is, uh, you know, kind of, if this is a dress rehearsal, the, the show's going to be a disaster because there have been much worse pandemics in the past. We've all had kind of a crash course on the history of pandemics because of the news these days. We know all sorts of new terms like mutations and variants and uh, infection rates. But if we look back at the one we were just re-educated about, the Spanish flu in 1918, that was at least 50 million people dead. And the Black Plague that hit again and again in the 1300s, that was at least 75 million people dead. So there were much worse ones. And really, those pair pale in comparison to what happened here. Next slide. The pandemics in the 1500s, when the Europeans came, new studies are saying that it's probably over 100 million people that died in the Americas. We're talking over 90% of everyone that lived in these continents died in the first few decades of contact. Next. So why doesn't everybody just know that? How is that not a fact that everybody knows about world history? It's clearly, it's a mega event in history. Well, next slide. Part of it is that the myth for really centuries was that Europe just conquered everybody here. That first off, there weren't that many people here. You know, there were people running around in buckskins. A couple of them made pyramids, and they were handily dispatched by Europe's superior military technology between their prowess and their guns and their horses. They just easily took everyone out. That, that is a total falsehood. And part of that falsehood was propagated by the Europeans, one disparaging the other. Next slide. There's this thing called the Black Legend that says that the Spanish conquistadors were these incredibly bloodthirsty and brutal people who ran through Latin America, cutting down everyone they could find, and that it was their brutality that killed everyone. That, again, is really not the way it was. Not to say that the conquistadors weren't pretty bad. They were. But I did a, I did a paper when I was in college looking at the actual numbers in the first couple of decades, and I looked at, you know, for every Spaniard in Mexico and the amount of people that died in Mexico in those first couple of decades, I ran the numbers, and if every Spaniard on the continent at that time, or in Mexico, I should say, killed an indigenous person one every minute for 24 hours a day for the first couple of decades, they still wouldn't have nearly approached how many people died. So this idea that it was uh, Europeans hacking people down, that's not true. It was the disease. And this black legend was actually started mostly by the Dutch and the English and the French who wanted to convince the Pope that the Spanish were bad and he should give management of the new world to them instead. So really, it was just a, a smear campaign that all of that started with to begin with. Nowadays, we know that it was the disease. Next slide. <clears throat> there it is. Amazingly, it was really only the 1970s that we started to recast what happened. And the trigger point was Alfred Crosby's 1972 book and subsequent theory that still talked about the Columbian Exchange. In this theory, he said, you know, yes, the things that happened socially and the cultural intersection was important, but what really changed the world was biological, that it was the exchange of foodstuffs, animals, and more importantly, diseases that really changed the dynamics of the world. You know, Europe got a whole bunch of new food. Their diet stunk before they met the new world. And they got all these wonderful things like tomatoes and avocados and corn and potatoes and chocolate. And in return, they gave them 13 deadly pandemic diseases and a few pigs and, and cows and things, which also brought those zoonotic diseases. So 
the exchange was somewhat uneven. And Europe got a whole new food supply and became healthier and stronger, where the people here in the New World became weaker and disease-filled. So this was a terrible exchange. Next slide. Now, the real key about talking about just how many people died starts and ends with how many people were here. And that's been a real misunderstanding, too. Um, we have a number of different estimates of how many people were here. And the community is pretty much broken up into what are called low counters and high counters. I am a high counter and, and proud of it. I think it's true. Uh, you know, one of the first real attempts to say who, how many people were here was made by Alfred Krober, who was an early ethnologist, anthropologist in the Americas, and he put together all the numbers as best he could, and he comes up with 8.1 million people before the Europeans arrived. He based those numbers based on how many people were left. In the, you know, in the 1800s, looking back into records of the 1600s. And at the time, you know, Krober just couldn't possibly conceive that that many people were gone. So, you know, saying something like, well, based on the population today, you know, it's half as much or it's a third as much. He had no idea that it could be 90 to 95 percent of the people that were gone, and hence this very low estimate looking at who was left, that probably contacted was 8.1 million. That's totally wrong. Today, with archaeology and better access to historical documents, even the most conservative of researchers say that it was hovering around 50 million people. But most folks, myself included, count much higher numbers. The highest estimate is actually 200 million. I kind of, I agonized over this particular slide. These are hard numbers, and I, you know, sometimes an idea gets thrown out, like the baby with the bathwater. You have, you know, oh, the, the high-enders and low-enders shoot each other down all the time. Oh, your stuff is guesswork. Your stuff is grossly underestimated. And so I don't want to say a high number, but, you know, that's kind of how it is. Um, I do believe with my experience in Latin America and here and the research that I've done over my whole lifetime that, and, and also including the new insight we have into just how terrible pandemics can be, that the number is way higher than most books are saying. And uh, I hope you all in college here know that just because something's published doesn't make it true. <laughs> we still are having a debate about these things. And I believe the numbers are hugely high. I would say that, you know, 150 million people, that's a reasonable estimate. Next slide. So how did these diseases spread? Let's talk a little bit about that. Next. You know, every kid in school here gets this rhyme. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, everybody knows that date because of that little rhyme, it should continue to the next verse and say, and pandemics came with him, because that's exactly what happened. Next slide. Interesting turn of history that actually, you know, Spain was under the domination of Arab kingdoms for some 700 years. And 1492 was actually also the year that the last of those big kingdoms were kicked out of Spain. It was in Granada in 1492 that Bobadil gave up the big palace called the Alhambra and went back across the Gibraltar Strait into the African continent. And Columbus and a number of his soldiers on his crew were actually part of that final campaign, and they got typhus during that campaign. So people that had one of these infectious diseases from Europe were part of the crew that went in the first voyages over to the Caribbean. I'd also like to point out that you know, Europe had had centuries of dealing with these kinds of epidemics, and they reached a certain level of herd immunity. They had already dealt with bubonic plague, pneumonic plague. They had touched on malaria. They had touched on cholera, smallpox, chickenpox. None of these things left. In fact, just about all the things I just named are still on the planet. 
There's an alarming amount of people that die every year in America of bubonic plague. It still happens. And so, but they had reached a certain, you know, stasis point. But all of those diseases were still waiting in the population of Europe. And when they came to the New World, it was like a bomb went off. So next slide. Here's a nice little graphic showing the four voyages of Columbus. And as you can see, he never stepped foot in North America nor South America. He barely even tagged uh, Central America at one point. And all through these voyages, he believed that he had hit the East Indies. And he said that till the day he died, that this was somehow or another the passage to the East Indies, which he had been contracted to find. I can't imagine he didn't have interpreters on his boats ready to go, you know, people that had already known Chinese and Japanese. Some of them must have been saying, hey, boss, uh, none of these people speak Chinese. I'm not sure we're where you think we are. Nevertheless, his insistence turned out to coin the word Indian or Indio, and to this day, 500 years later, there are whole populations that are named after his ridiculous misunderstanding. But as you can see, his voyage is really focused on the Caribbean, and that's where the Spanish and the Europeans first went. Next slide, if we can zoom in on, uh, oh, I was gonna say, you know, along with him, once really by his second and third voyage, there was a steady stream of ships following him. And they were all landing in the Caribbean and making these communities and bringing more sick people with them. Next slide. That's the one I thought was coming up. <clears throat> so Hispaniola, which is now half Haiti, half Dominican Republic, that was really the first big Hispanic settlement. And nowadays we know that the first two diseases that showed up were typhus and influenza. And arguments, again, were kind of low-ending how much the population was there. But nowadays, most researchers say the population, when the Spanish got there, was about 8 million people just on that island, just on Hispaniola. And if that sounds big to you, recognize that today, between Haiti and Dominican Republic, there's 21 million people living on the island. So certainly the island could have supported that population, did have that population, and Spaniards again and again reported these horrific die-offs. It was like a horrible petri dish of disease. We know typhus and influenza. Maybe some of the other ones came early too. But in any event, within a decade of them arriving and setting these settlements down, the population went from 8 million to less than half a million. So there it is right there. The very first place they populated went down to 90% plus of them dead in a decade. And those people, you know, the, the people of the Caribbean islands were great sailors. They had these big canoes and they went all back and forth. A lot of them, when they got sick, they ran. So by the time the Spanish started spilling out into the other islands, a lot of them they found completely uninhabited, uninhabited, just people dead already. The disease spread that far. And it spread to the other continents like a wildfire. Next. By 1505, we know that there were so few people in Hispaniola that they started importing black African slaves because there was nobody left to work for them in the fields and things they had created, all the sugarcane fields, things like that. And unfortunately, those black slaves brought yet more pandemics. They brought yellow fever and malaria, which was very, you know, everybody had a certain immunity to it, especially the slaves that were brought over, but not the Native Americans. They had never felt that before. So that again caused this huge wave. Next slide. In the 1510s, at least, smallpox shows up. In the 1530s, measles hits. So all those things are swirling around and at least six different pandemic diseases were happening all at once in the new world. Next, infection rates. You know, with, this is a new term. Everybody knows about this R not in the infection rate. COVID is a, an infection rate of 1.4 to 1.8. That means for every one person that's infected, 
they might infect 1.4 to 1.8 people. Smallpox is 3.5 to 6 people. And measles, horrifyingly, is 12 to 18. That means that if I had measles, every one of you have measles now. So as quickly and horrifyingly as we have now witnessed COVID spreading through our communities, imagine if COVID was 18 times more infectious and how quickly this would spread. That's exactly what was happening. And that's one of the reasons I think that we're way underestimating the numbers. I mean, just by virtue of the people that were left with six of them swirling at once, the numbers are bigger than we've ever wanted to admit. Another interesting thing that we know now, that even in the time of Alex, or uh, uh, Crosby's Columbian Exchange we didn't know, is how these pandemic diseases mutate and, var and the variants. You know, we all are now praying that the Delta variant is the last one of COVID. Now imagine these super diseases, and it's all about how fast it can go through the population, and it's just, it's a numbers game. So many, so many, so many, bang, mutation. Something else happens again, then it swirls back through. That's what happened with the Black Plague that we now understand and they didn't know then. That's what happened with these. One proof is when I was looking through all of the, uh, the Spanish chronicles from Hispaniola, it's interesting to note that in the first couple of years, none of the Spaniards were really getting sick. They were just noting that the Taino people were getting sick. But then a few years into it, all the Spanish started getting sick too. What does that mean? probably means that a variant showed up and started getting them sick too. But that means that, you know, a European could hit a coast, infect at one point, and that same guy didn't have to walk across to California. That disease rolled through people, mutated, rolled more. It would have its own momentum and even pick up momentum if it was bad. So next slide. No. After the Caribbean, the Spanish moved to the mainland. The first place they really sieged was the Aztecs. They went to the Maya first and they said, hey, anybody making any gold here? No, just corn, okay, we'll get back to you later. And they went to the Aztecs. And they landed in 1519. There were you know, a number of events that I imagine you're relatively familiar with, but it really wasn't until 1521 that the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan was finally uh, conquered. And when they conquered it, it really wasn't the couple thousand uh, or the thousand or so Spaniards and the 20,000 Anglo slash Collins that took over this community of you know, more than a quarter million people. It was the disease. When the walls finally broke down and they came into the city, the Spanish Chronicles report that the streets were covered in rotted corpses with all of those pustules all over them. The people had died of smallpox long before. When they came in, the few defenders were the only people holding the door left. Everybody else was already dead of the disease. So it was the smallpox, not Cortez's sword who did it to them. Next slide. Same thing happened with the Inca Empire even worse, you know, if the, the Inca were already completely under siege with smallpox and measles by the time Pizarro got there in 1532. 1532 is when he actually met uh, I, uh, uh, the, the main Inca there. I'm blanking on his name for a second. What? Atahualpa, thank you, thank you. I was going to say I, ayahuasca was in my head. No, that's not right. Well, his, his father was Huanacapac. And Huanacapac, the king, died in Cusco in 1524. So if Cortez was up at the Aztec Empire in 1521 and had touched on the Maya, that meant in just three years, the disease burned all the way through Central America, all the way into South America, all the way up into the Andes and touched an elite, hardly anybody ever sees him guy, the Inca himself in Cusco at 11,000 feet above sea level. That in and of itself shows you how just quickly 
these diseases were spreading all through the Americas. And the poor Inca, they had already been at civil war because of this, that many millions of people had already died. In fact, some of the things I read said the Inca, when they reported on it, the first diseases did not come from the north. They actually came from the south. They came from uh, Bolivia and the Amazon there. The first people that they remembered getting sick were more down like at Lake Titicaca, which means those people probably got sick from the first Portuguese who showed up to the Amazon side. Next one. And that kind of leads me into this next point, that Columbus was not the only person contacting the New World at this time before 1500. We also know that the Portuguese and the French and the English were up in this area. They came through from the East Coast and into the Great, Plain, into the Great Lakes. We know that the Portuguese were also down in South America. And, you know, by the early 1500s, the Portuguese crown had already put rules and taxation on cod fishing off the coast of Newfoundland. By the time the king is taxing and regulating it, a lot of people have already been there. And though, you know, we have names like, you know, Champlain and, and uh, the early French explorers that were sanctioned by the crown, we know that the first contact and things like this are not done by these government officials. They are done by the rough people, you know, the guys that first came in looking for furs to trade. They were pirates. They were mercenaries. And they were not the kind of guys that kept a diary and journaled and like, oh, I think I'll publish a book about this. Those, those, those are the first rough people who came through before 1500 when the French sent emissaries in to negotiate with the Algonquins about uh, fur trading rights, it was those first wave of people who told them, well, there's these people down there and those are the people you should contact. So the trigger had already been pulled. I think this is a really important point. You know, we, Plymouth Rock is the standard for America. That was, you know, 130 years after the first Portuguese and French showed up in this area, and if a single one of them was sick, it starts the snowball, and that snowball could have gone all the way to California, probably did. By the time Europeans came to record who was here, yeah, there were nobody left, and it was because these diseases had wiped them out. Next. One that I think is a particularly poignant uh, and accessible chronicle is Hernando de Soto's uh, basically reign of terror for three years through the Americas. He gets the commission from Spain to come and uh, claim this land for Spain. He was actually with Pizarro, had already helped conquer the Inca Empire, went home to Spain, sat on his pile of riches for a while, got bored, and came back to do it again to North America. And this red line is his reign all the way through. When it turns blue, that's where he died, on the Mississippi. But he goes through Florida, finding a number of big cities and communities. The Appalachian people had a capital city surrounded by towns, and it had a palisade, it had plumbing, it had a big pyramid in the middle with the king's palace on top that DeSoto stayed in for a summer, but he was looking for gold. He finds this little boy named Perico in that community who had come from the north. And he said, oh, I'm from this place with this queen, Kofitakechi, and we have this kind of shiny metal you're talking about up there. So they follow uh, Perico, who's one of his translators, up through a big patch of wilderness where they almost die because they're used to just finding Indian communities beating them up and taking their corn and eating it. Once they went through this large patch of wilderness, they were really bad at hunting. They couldn't catch any of the animals and they almost died. And they were actually saved by this queen, Kofit to catch. Next slide. This is a nice little black and white of image of her contacting DeSoto. She was very nice about it. She came and saved them, gave them food, brought them into her huge capital city called Telemeco, which is near modern day Columbia, South Carolina. And 
DeSoto did what he normally does. He took over the town. He rooted around. He went up into their big, beautiful temple. And inside of it, inside that temple on top of a pyramid, he walks in and he finds a number of tombs. And each one of them are guarded by a big stone statue of a warrior, each one of them with a different kind of weapon. And he contemplates, you know, wow, this is a really, you know, uh, warrior society. Where are all those guys? Why didn't anybody attack us? He roots through some of the, the tombs and finds Spanish objects, pieces of glass and Spanish metal. At the same time, he sent his men around to the surrounding towns to go collect corn, and they discover that the temples in the little towns are absolutely full of stacks of cork corpses, all had died from sickness, so many people that they couldn't even keep up with burying or cremating them. And so it was explained, yes, there's this terrible wave of illness coming back through. It's not the first one, but you know, a lot of our warriors have died. A lot of our farmers have died. We don't have much corn. And yes, those objects that you found were from a Spanish community that was on the coast about a decade ago, and they all died and left. So Here's the disease raging. There's a settlement nearby. Who knows whether it came from that settlement, whether they were in another wave, whether it came from another direction. But he saw all of these people dying of disease. Sadly, it's a footnote in his adventure. That was not what he was interested in. He was interested in gold and silver. Kofit Takachi actually sent, uh, sent uh, traders out immediately to go get him the gold and silver that he wanted. But it turned out they actually came up to the Great Lakes area and they showed back up in like three days, really, you know, FedEx ancient style. And they showed up with mica and copper. <laughs> and he said, that's not what I'm looking for. But it sounded just like it. So he went off on his adventure and thank God eventually died. But uh, I bring this one up to say that he witnessed all of these people dying. Little did he know that he was carrying that same kind of infection everywhere he went. Next slide. So sadly, you know, religion and beliefs on both sides did not help either, and neither did science. Next one. From a science and medical perspective, Europe was still functioning under the idea of the four humors theory, that humans are made out of black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. This was actually something that Hipparchus had come up with in 500 BC. So for 2,000 years at this point, medicine had not progressed past this point in Europe, and nobody had a clue what an infectious disease was. In fact, most of the healing was not done by these medical practitioners. It was a faith-based thing. Next slide. So, you know, the, when the Spanish priests came and the other European priests as well, came to the Americas. It was a golden opportunity to get a whole bunch of new Christians. Uh, Christianity was really at an all-time low popularity in Europe at the time. You know, there was the Renaissance and, of course, everybody dying from the Black Plague kind of uh, made everybody lose faith in the church. They said you could save them, but then they themselves died. So here was an opportunity to get a whole new bunch of Christians. And they told them, oh, look, if you just become Christian, God will save you. God's obviously smiting you because you're pagans. So just please become Christians. And in this panic of everyone dying and, and the perspective of native folks that I'll speak about in a moment, they kind of lined up to become Christians in an attempt to be saved. Next slide. Unfortunately, the way you become a Christian is you get baptized in holy water. <laughs> so in all of these places, they put one bowl of holy water and then splashed that diseased water on everybody's face. So they'd line them up to become Christians, but really what they were doing is making darn sure that everybody got the disease. There was one uh, account that I read of a Jesuit priest in the middle of the Amazon who honestly wanted to save all these people and was upset that God was attacking them. And he set up these utopian communities and he would bring them from their various tribal areas and bring them in and baptize them. And he wrote that 
he was baptizing up to 10,000 people a day, and yet they were still dying in droves, and he couldn't figure out why. And that poor guy was actually the agent of exactly what he was trying to avoid. And just a, a tragic thing. And at least in his case, he was not some kind of vicious person trying to kill everyone. He was trying to save them. He just had no idea, like everybody did, what was going on. Next. It, it really, the, 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 the native belief systems weren't helping at all either. You know, people that are now called pejoratively brujos or shamans, medicine men, witch doctors, these folks believed that any sickness had a spiritual foundation. There really wasn't an idea in all of the New World that sickness was physical, that it was always some sort of spirit attacking your spirit and that the solution had to be a spirit. Now, oftentimes that spirit was the spirit of a plant. So there was, you know, there was medicine that was happening that was real for, you know, the less understood reason that it is as science today, but it was all spiritual. And so when one person got sick, it was likely some sort of spiritual attack, attacking their soul. When everybody got sick, that meant that either the gods or the ancestors or everybody was mad at you, and that societally you were supposed to be doing something different. So when everybody got sick at once, people really felt like their gods and ancestors had abandoned them. And terrible timing for these guys in brown robes to show up saying, well, you know what? There's really only one true God. And if you just accept him, you'll be okay. So it was, it was demoralizing and it was probably motivating a lot of people to try to accept this other God because the, the, the sickness was proof positive of his power. Unfortunately, the baptisms in bowls of holy water didn't go the way they wanted it to. Next. So, you know, these, these pandemics, they were nothing less than apocalyptic. The very first thing that happened in those first contexts were that the very young and the very old died, just like these diseases do. You know, uh, COVID, unfortunately, is coming for our elders again. The one before, if you remember, was H1N1, swine flu. That one was specifically targeting kids under the age of five. So that was a scare. But when six to 12 diseases are happening at once, everybody's targeted, but the first to go are the young and the old, which leaves the remaining strong adults really only half trained. And a lot of the native communities it was oral tradition, and elders would slowly train people to be part of the next generation. So they're all half-trained, and they have very few youth to actually pass on what little they remember of the tradition to the next generation. And really, in a terrible moment like that, nobody wants to have babies. In that generation, probably nobody had babies because it was a terrible world. How could you bring someone into that world? So this was a terrible attack on the culture and the civilization. Next one. You know, there's also, I mean, just the disillusionment and the depression, the idea that, you know, if disease is the proof of spirits attacking you or the powers that be being displeased with you, gosh, I mean, everybody must have felt like, what have we done wrong? Why, why are we being treated like this by our, our own uh, religion, basically? And they must have felt like their gods had abandoned them. So even though they were very well capable of fighting off the Europeans in their own land, probably a lot of people just were too depressed or sick to do so. And that caused a lot of fleeing and groups that were, you know, for centuries, this is our territory, that's yours, we trade here, this is all, everybody's copacetic, we all know where we live. All of a sudden, everybody's pressed together, and there's fighting, and there's arguments, and there's stress on resources, fighting for land, and fighting for food. It's just like, you know, we're all sitting here nice right now, but if somebody pulls the fire alarm, we all might be elbow to elbow at the door in a moment. That's, that's what happened on a, on a continental scale. When the, when the Europeans showed up. 
So there was loss of homes, culture, language, traditions. And, and this didn't just happen for you know, the first couple decades and stop. This happened wave after wave of these diseases and the variants kept coming through for over 200 years. Next. So at the end, these pandemics in Europe, from Europe, they killed 90 to really 95%, maybe even more of everybody who lived on this continent 500 years ago. Arguably, that's the worst human die-off in the entire history of the planet. How many cultures, traditions, and languages died with them? We'll never know, but for sure, you know, in terms of languages, it was hundreds. In terms of entire civilizations, you know, we really can't say. There are places that by the time anybody who wrote a history was there, there was nothing but bones bleaching on the ground, and anybody who knew who they were died with them. It's really just amazingly tragic what happened. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> I hate to end the presentation on that note, so let's talk a little bit about today. Um, so next slide. Native American descendants, the people that survived that terrible time, they're precious. There are not many of them, and who they are are the stewards of the diversity that once was the American continents. And they are few, but actually, I would argue, and uh, others have too, that they have allies that don't really realize they're part of this. Next slide. Anybody seen this? <laughs> this is a great show. John Leguizamo is a comic, of course. You probably know him from all sorts of movies. And his show is irreverent. It's a one-man show that he does on the stage, like I'm standing here, Latin history for morons. But it has a very profound point he's making. He says he made this show because his middle school son came home one day and said, oh, we've got this project that... We've got to do, we've got to talk about the heroes of our uh, ethnic background. And, uh, you know, we're Puerto Rican. I can't think of any Puerto Rican heroes. And so Legazamo thinks about this, thinks about how to help his son, and realizes, you know, we're, we're modern-day Puerto Ricans, yes, but our ancestry is not just European. It's not Latino per, completely. It's also indigenous. We are the descendants of great civilizations, the Aztecs, the Inca, you know, the Mississippians. He doesn't say that in his show, but I think he should. Um, and, and so I, I think a lot of the Latino community is coming around, thanks to Legazamo and other people, to realizing they're not just second-class European citizens. They are also the descendants of these great civilizations of Native Americans. And when the Latino community and the North American, the Native American community get together, you're a much larger voting block looking for the rights and respect for Native people than we've ever had before. I think this is a day coming. <laughs> Next. But you know, right now, we're still in a danger zone. As I said, and as you well know, there are very few Native American folks left. And unfortunately, COVID is raging through these communities and once again coming for the elders. You know, this community I've read is doing very well. Good job, Saginaw Chippewa group. You guys are really taking care of each other and being smart about it. But nationally speaking, the indigenous community has lost the most people. This chart here, the purple one on the bottom, is indigenous Americans dead by COVID per capita? This is from July of this year. So this is huge. There's, you know, we really need to pay attention to this and we are once again, the most vulnerable and already paid the price for pandemics community are the ones who are losing the most. I'm sure you all saw at one point early on the Navajo, that small little community had the most deaths of anywhere in the United States. That's just not right. Next. Conclusion, you know, those that don't learn from history are damned 
to repeat it. And the cultural diversity of this nation is on the line right now with this newest pandemic. We know what it's done to the communities. So I say to you know anyone who's listening, let's protect our native communities now. And thank you and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Do we have time for any questions? Should I stand here and ask anybody if they have a question? Absolutely. You don't have to have a question. It's cool. I, I won't take it personally. It'll just be, I was so complete about the topic. There was nothing left to discuss. <laughs> well, all right then.